Hey Don't y'all, know. I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. You start too and early. And I start too early, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait for the finger, I like your son. We're going to have some fun tonight because we are sorry. making a turning saw. And I think I need to buy some chocolates for my wife now. Sorry about that, babe. Yeah, <laughs> do it every week. And uh, if you do have any questions for the chat, go ahead and let them down below. If you are watching this as a recording, then you can look down in the description and I will list out all the questions and have a timestamp so you can get pretty close to where they are in the video. But tonight we're actually going to be starting on the next process for the live video. In the past we did a joinery window where we did nine joints over the course of nine weeks. And that was a lot of fun, but I actually want to make something in the live videos. And so we're going to be doing a series now. We're going to be making a turning saw. So what is a turning saw? Basically, it is the hand tool equivalent of a of a uh, boat of a band saw. Wow, that was hard to pull out. <laughs> and a while ago, I made this one, which is, is currently I don't have it strung up. I probably should have done that for the video, but I didn't. Oh well. Um, and this is this is a great one, works well. But I want to do something that's a little bit smaller, a little bit more lightweight. And uh, for most of the most of the work, I only need a blade that's about 12 inches. I don't need one that's 24 inches. And I do have a video on making this one. I think I made it about two years ago. So if you want to go and see that, you can. This one was made out of a uh, sapili. Um, the kit we're going to be making one of is actually from Gramercy Tools. Uh, it's being sold by Tools for Working Wood. And this is, I'm absolutely loving this. Let me actually zoom in and show you some of the hardware on this. It is a kit that I've wanted to make for a while now. And I'm finally getting around to it, so you guys get to, uh, to come along for the journey. And so what they have are these two little brass screws that go through the handle of the turning saw. And then we can make a handle that goes on there. It comes with the blades. I have uh, three different blades that I purchased, three different uh, teeth patterns. And then the thing I was really happy about, the string for tensioning it, you know, it's usually like a twine or something like that. They actually had a blue string I could purchase. And I was like, <gasps> blue. <laughs> yeah, if you watch Alex uh, Alex Steele, I could say Blue Dykem. Should I start singing the song? Um, so we are going to be having fun with this kit. Now the other thing about it is that Tools for Working Wood also has the plans available for it. And these anyone can download for free. You don't need to buy the kit. Um, and I'm basically going to be making what they have here, except I'm going to be making a few alterations, things that I want in my turning saw. And we're going, to be, we're going to be starting off by making a turning saw, making it functional, having it kind of ugly, and then we're going to detail it down and do some really fun things. And in the last couple of videos in this, we'll be doing some carving and the, the pretty things that make it kind of special. So this will hopefully be an heirloom quality, final, fine detail saw that uh, when I pass away and my kids no longer do woodworking, they can hang it on the wall and people walk up to it and go, ooh, that looks cool. So <laughs> we'll be having a little bit of fun with that. Um, any questions before I get going? Not at the moment, except they said, yes, chocolate is good. <laughs> Throwing it chocolate safe distances. Sushi. <laughs> yeah, if any of you don't know, my wife and I love our sushi. Which is kind of a newer thing, but we, we do like sushi. Um, Who knew? Yes, so um, basically what I'm going to be doing with this, because there are a lot of pieces that are doubled up, um, I'm going to make one ahead of time off camera. It gets my brain wrapped around what we're doing, and then I'll make the other one on camera. Um, and that way I'm not doing every little step live, um, but most of it will be live, and you'll be able to see everything that would need to happen to create a uh, saw. Now, traditionally, and if you know anything about this channel, I am not a traditionalist. Um, I, I don't do hand tools because I want to duplicate what it was done in the past. I do hand tools because I want to have the fun of it. Traditionally, they were often made of really hard woods, uh, like a, a hickory or a, uh, a, a beech or a maple, um, something that's very sturdy. And those work fantastic. They are a great to, a wood that aren't going to cause you any problems, and uh, you're not going to have to worry about breaking them. They're, you can make them very, very thin and still have a sturdy saw. And so originally I was going to make it out of hickory because uh, I have plenty of hickory in stock. And I, I like hickory, um, other than the fact that hickory is a pain to work with. Uh, it would make a great tool that would last a long time and be a, a wonderful thing to have. But then I was going through my stock and I found this piece of black walnut. And I thought, I'm going to do it out of black walnut. <laughs> uh, now, you can make this out of any wood you want. It's better to make it out of a harder wood because you're going to be putting some tension on this. And if it's in tension a lot, then you may end up weakening it over time. 
But walnut is actually a surprisingly solid wood. It is a little bit more brittle, uh, but as long as we take care not to make it too thin, it will work very well for this. So I'm gonna be making mine out of walnut. You can make yours out of whatever you want. Um, what's the next thing I need to talk about? The plans. Let me pull up this sheet and show you something else that I'm changing. Switching this over once I find my clicker. Number two. So the plans that come with this um, are fairly straightforward and they're, they're kind of conservative. Everything has a, a, a simple chamfer on it. Uh, they're fairly straightforward. But one of the things that I've seen a lot of old turning saws, especially the really interesting ones, is the beam isn't perfectly straight like this. Now, if you're working with really straight grain, then having this perfectly straight beam works well because you can have a fiber that runs from one end all the way down to the other and it keeps it nice and strong and stiff. But what I've seen is a lot of them, they'll actually take this beam and they'll bend the top end and these two tops come together and it looks kind of cool. There's, a, there's a, a, a fineness to it that I like. So what I did is I cut out one of the patterns and rather than keeping it straight, I bent it and then taped it back together. Um, pretty simple little modifications I can do. And then what I did with this is I, I could have used this, but it was a little bit flimsy here, so I then transferred it to another piece of paper. And then I now have this as my pattern for the bow. So it's basically the exact same thing, except it's bent a little bit. Now the problem with bending that a little bit is we want to find a piece of wood that matches it. So let me actually zoom in here and show you this a little bit better. There we go. So if I were to use this pattern on here, I have a grain of wood coming through here the problem is the grain of wood would run out here, and then this arm sticking out this way wouldn't, wouldn't have the strength of that grain of fiber running all the way through it. So you need to find something that kind of bends to go with it. And thankfully, this piece of walnut here actually has this spot where the grain turns. And it was perfect, so I can set this on here. And so now the grain is straight here, and then it turns a little bit at the end. So I actually get a piece of, uh, I get a fiber that will go from this all the way throughout and bends out. So if you have, if you want to do that, try and find a board where the grain runs through because it is very important if you want to make this arm thin, you want to make sure you have the fiber of the wood running all the way down the, uh, the piece. So that is what we are going to be working on tonight. And uh, back to this one. So what I've done so far is I cut out the pattern I shaped it the way I wanted to make it, I made my final pattern, and then I traced it onto this, well, I traced it onto this, <laughs> and beforehand I cut this out. So this is what we're going to be doing. We're just going to be doing the rough shaping on this, and uh, taking it kind of down to what it will sort of look like. The idea is we want to get the whole frame functional. I don't care if the handles are smooth, I don't care if the grip feels good, I don't care if everything is sanded down and clean and ready for finish. I want it functional. So I want to have a beam spreading two arms with a blade and a string. And that's all the turning saw needs to actually be functional. Well, and then a tensioner, which we'll get to that later. So we need to make a functional piece. So we're going to do that with this stick. So let me transfer over and set this up. Two back you out and let you guys see exactly what I'm doing here. Now when I transfer these on here, and I need to be careful, actually no I don't need to be careful of that because <laughs> I have this one this way, so what would happen if I made two left hand bow bows? Oh well, I'll just flip one of them over. Um, so it was originally the, the thought went through my brain, oh no, I have to be careful, I make sure I flip this pattern over the other way, but it really doesn't matter. <laughs> There's a reason my wife married me. It wasn't for my brains. <laughs> We're why still you, trying to figure out. No. <laughs> why did you snort at that, babe? I love I'm going to try and find the place where the pattern, where the grain bends and where I like it. I think that's right about there. So I'm going to hold this down. And to transfer it, I'm going to actually put the Sharpie on here. And the Sharpie is going to be half on the pattern and half off the pattern. And I'm just going to keep my fingers in place so that I can actually transfer this all the way around. I don't know if you guys can hear our kids, but uh, they're making noise. Because <laughs> our kids normally are. Any questions? No, well, worth the effort said something 
about leave room for a star washer to help with unnecessary rotation. Does that mean anything to star you? Star washer. I don't know what you're talking about there. Okay, worth the effort. You want to clarify. And then he put dragon head on top. So I don't know if he's talking about an embellishment. But then it made me think of the movie How to Train Your Dragon and how I'm excited for that one to come. Yes. Because we're nerds and it's okay. No, I am going to be doing some Celtic <laughs> carving because this is wood by right. What's this? You're doing carving? Celtic carving, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm I, gonna I was actually do... kind of shocked you didn't grab white oak. <laughs> to be um, I, I had thought about it. White <laughs> oak is um, a, a somewhat more brittle wood. It's not bad. Um, and it is a mm. bit more open grain than even walnut. Um, so it's not the best. I probably could have, but walnut is such a fun wood to work with. It is so easy and so clean. Uh, so now we have our pattern on here. Let's do some rough cutting. Back this up, set you in a different place. I love being able to move around like 100 people at one time. It makes me feel like I'm like Hercules or something. I love how my stool from when I was three is under there. That is a 30-year-old stool. <laughs> yes, this stool down here. I had my kids in the shop doing some woodworking with me. So I bring out the stool so Shout they can see. Shout out to my Uncle Paul. <laughs> <laughs> now, for some reason... Did you say what you're going to use for the blade? Ab Aubrey Kuhn just asked. Um, yes, they, uh, they're actually the ones that come with the kit um, from Tools for Working Wood. Um, my other blade, my other saw, I actually use uh, a bandsaw blade that I modify, which works fine. Uh, but they have these ones... Uh, that actually have the, the fittings on the end that make them very easy to put on and off. So that makes them a lot more fun. So we're going to start by cutting this to length. <laughs> very rough cuts here. <laughs> Do I want to know? <laughs> Just because... Um, <clears throat> B-Power goes, no socks in the clogs, you animal. <laughs> and that's because you don't have any clean. Yeah, I'm... Uh, <laughs> Oh, shoot, I forgot he to put him in the dryer, too. He does his own laundry, so that's all on him. I, <laughs> I washed my hands of that a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, the tan line's pretty impressive, too. <laughs> well, um, actually, I had several people that were that were, um, that were thought me odd for wearing socks with the clogs. Well, so I've thought about wearing them barefoot more it's often. It's quite a statement <laughs> here. I don't know. The, the socks look kind of odd, um, but... Now I've got the uh, the ball here on the end, and one of the things I'm actually thinking about doing is kind of doing the the scroll like you see on a uh, um, on a violin um, on the end here. So that's that's something I'm thinking about with the carving. So I'm leaving kind of like this extra knob to work with in the future. So I'm going to cut down into that notch. Like this. I'm not drawing any lines. I'm just eyeballing my cuts. Making them to eh, about that size, about that place. And this is a part that I really enjoy because I can just cut it. I don't have to worry about anything particular. Actually, I'm going to do this one a little bit differently. I'm going to cut this one back. I'm going to cut that out in a moment. Flip this around. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. up. Oh look, you can see my cord. And give you that focus. There you go. So what I have here is I have the end dropping boards there. At the end here, and I want to cut this off nice and flat. So to do that, I'm actually going to grab my marking knife. And I want to draw a straight line for the end of this so I know exactly where I'm cutting. So I'll cut this in there, this in there, cut across. Now I have a line that I can cut down and I know is right on the end of that. Make it easier for me in the future. So I don't have to plane off as much. A board on purpose yes all right I have, I have a question sure so I'm thinking that's pronounced 
Raybo, Rebo. Sorry if I screwed that up. Why use the back vice like 96%? I, I like that number. Of the time instead of the front ones. Oh, Rubo. Rubo. Oh, yeah. Rubo. I knew I could. The French guy who does woodworking. Um, why I use this as opposed to using the leg vices? Uh, I just use it all the time. Uh, it is the vice that I, I grab to. It is quick. It is easy. It is, it is probably the most versatile vice on the bench um, because I can use it as an end vice. I can use it as a face vice. I can use it as a... Uh, um, like a uh, um, joinery vice, there's the term I'm forgetting, I'll remember it in a while. Um, it's just a really useful vice and it's here and easy, it works <laughs> quickly, um, and it's what I've gotten used to. Is there a right or wrong to one or the other? No, I just use this far more than I use leg vices. Personal preference. Whoa. <laughs> we were worried about the glare earlier, now we just caught your head. What, this? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Okay, but then, um, ah, where'd it go? My brain just stopped. Worth the effort. He clarified the whole, um, thing earlier. Star nut? The star nut, yeah. The star washer goes between the wood and brass shoulder, epoxy to wood, so it bites in grass. I see what you're saying. Prevents the handle from rotating as easily, but it needs space designed into the handle. I may be doing that. Not tonight, but um, there are a lot of uh, little things that I may be doing on this that I, um, things I can change in the original kit. We'll see. Um, that is one of the things I'm thinking about is something similar to that. So, yeah. so now that I have, here, let me show you what I've got before I go. I have the pattern here. I want to cut down as much as I can and remove as much of the waste as I can with a saw because the more I can get rid of the saw, the less I'm going to have to worry about or work around. So, we're going to cut down this way. And you notice I switched from my cross cut uh, carcass saw to my tenon saw. Oop, dropping more wood. No, you're supposed to say hi, Doc. And particularly, I'm trying to clean up the faces here. I want to try and keep these as square as possible because that is what the, uh, the, the bolt that goes through that holds the blade will be connected to. So I want to keep this nice and square on the end. One side, <coughs> let's do the other. So I think off. we had someone join us a little later because Kim Allen asked, where is the kit from again? It is from Tools for Working Wood. Um, babe, if you look at the website that I put up. Oh, hang on. Oop. I, I can do... No, I'll see if she can send you all a link to it. This, this Grammarly. Yep, that's the link. If you can just throw that into the chat. Ooh, that tab. See if I can get this to work. What's that? Ah. There you go. Now you can all follow that. And if you're not watching this live, it is in the description below. And if you want to follow along with the build, go for it. I love Tools for Working Wood. Really cool site. A lot of good information. Let me grab something with a little deeper throat. Like a panel saw, particularly. Eh, it's a cross cut. Oh well. Whoa. This has a thicker plate, so I gotta let it work down. Oh wow, she's dull. go back and sharpen this one sometime. <laughs> Although I hate to say that about a lot of my tools. If it's not sharp, I just grab another one. Now, at this point I want to talk about order of operations. So let me show you what I've got here. Parentheses. No, exponents, parentheses. There we go. Now, Not paying attention. in the pattern, there is a radius that goes here where the beam connects, and that allows the beam to rotate. We're going to worry about that, we're going to worry about that radius later. Right now, I just want to cut it off square. Once we make that beam, then we'll come back in and create the radius here 
and a matching radius on the beam itself. So for right now, we're just cutting straight across that. Don't worry about the radius in the pattern. So now I've cut from here all the way up into here. And because this is angled, I'm going to cut from here down to that, and then from here down to that. Try and get rid of as much of the mass as I can with a saw. Actually, I'm going to cut this way first. Get rid of this excess chunk. <laughs> Uh-oh, she's laughing again. <laughs> well, worth the effort says, oh, how sexist. If it's dull, it's a she. If it's sharp, is it a he? <laughs> <laughs> how did you know? Well, I was just going to say, you know, be careful what you're referring to as, soul, as dull when you say she. Cause... <laughs> oh, quick tip. When you're cutting at a really steep angle, just set it 90 degrees to the wood. Do a slice in until you get a little bit of kerf, and then bring it up, and now you're ready to cut all this straight down. And I'll bust that off later, and let's do the exact same thing over here. I want to start right there. And I'm not caring about being really detailed or quality cuts because everything here is going to be cleaned up with a spoke shave and chisel. And all. Oh, that was a bad angle right there. Quality cuts like that. You can see how I was, I was catching on there. I was actually putting too much force into the saw, driving the teeth down in. You need to think about actually lifting the teeth off of the cut. Let's cut off this little chunk here. Just like that. So now we have this rough cut out. We can come in with a chisel and bring it all down to its line, bring in with spoke shave. And this is where the fun really comes out. If you know anything about my channel, you know that I love the chisel work. So let's start in on that, particularly with this little spiral. Move this over. Oops, sorry. Loss of connection. It's so shiny. <laughs> I gotta switch back cameras, don't I? No, we're seeing a nice top view. There, hopefully that moved it back. I Two, think it kind of like slid down, so. No, I have unplugged it and had to switch back. There we go. This would be nice if I had a Videographer dad joke ones. inbound. I've been, oh, they want a dad joke. You want a dad joke? Uh oh, how are you supposed to think about a dad joke on the fly? Uh, let's see, what's a good one? Oh, man, I can't think of a dad joke right now. If someone has a dad joke, talk. post it, and my wife will tell it. But then it be a mom joke. So I've got this extra here. I'm just gonna pop that off. French fries are fried in France. Or not fried in France, but in Greece. One quick cut. <laughs> oh, yes. That is a good one. I like that one. <laughs> Doesn't he have an apprentice? Yeah. <laughs> I'll assume my wife might be joining me with some of this. Yeah. I'm too expensive Of course, then to be uh, I think I become the apprentice suddenly. <laughs> Isn't that the way it works? Now, one of the things that I heard someone say recently was that all woodworking is just different forms of carving. So if you ever get worried about doing carving, don't, because it's just another form of woodworking. <laughs> Did I just crack myself up and no one else? Uh, pretty much. Okay. Why, okay, Tim Cheatwood says, why can't you hear a, ter a pterodactyl in the going to the bathroom? Okay, Tim, I wanna know, why not? <laughs> So I'm cutting in the majority, and then when I want to do detail, I'm actually going to go across the grain. Make sure you can see this. I'll move back a little bit. I should probably cut from the other side. The P is silent. <laughs> <laughs> We've been in the sun all day, so. Yes. We were at a water park today. Okay, now we've got all the dad jokes going. <laughs> Did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? <clears> hmm. <throat> Hey, Ben. 
I didn't hear about the restaurant on the moon. Do tell. And now we can just start shaving in. Great. So. <laughs> I like that one. All right, Steve. Why did the washing machine... It's probably sharp enough. I can just push. Just like that. Ooh, I love that. One of the things I love about walnut is it's just so easy to work. I want to guess something with the spinning, but I don't know. It was, ah, uh, it was loaded. What's it? Nothing. We're talking about dad jokes over oh. here. <laughs> now, when I get close to the line, I actually want to turn it bevel down. Because I get more control, bevel down. I can even hit my microphone with my, with my mallet. Making sure not to go too far and pop this little spiral off the end here. So on a slightly more serious question, Aubrey Kuhn asked, do you, did you have a particular project in mind to use the saw on when you're done with it? Oh, no, I just always want to use a turning saw. A turning saw makes, uh, is, is one of the quickest and easiest ways to add details into any project because you can quickly shape things out. And this, like in this case, if I were to be making this, I'd use a turning saw to cut this out. It would go really quickly and just slice it right down the line and be done with it. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm not actually cutting this with a turning saw or coping saw, which would actually go pretty quickly, because I don't want to try and use a turning saw to make a turning saw, lest I get all those comments of, oh, now I have to go buy a turning saw so I can make a turning saw. <laughs> so um, now the other thing that I can grab is a spoke shave, and I can de clean things up down to that line, except for... I'm working on a rounded surface with a flat bottom spoke shave. Come on, catch it. There you go. Which isn't a problem. Just takes a little bit of getting used to. To get these really nice cuts. And I'm staying away from the line a little bit. I want to leave it a little proud because I can always come back and clean it up later. So now we got that side. Let's do this side. I don't have too much to take off here. I can get a lot of it with that. But let's keep going with the chisel. Now, in this case, let me make sure that this is in view. It's not. Turn a little bit more here. Up a little bit more. Focus a little bit more. There we go. Now, what I've got here is it's going to be coming downhill, cutting through the grain this way, and then it comes back up. And so if I keep chopping out here, the grain is going to run away and I'm going to split away this end. So I need to actually make sure I chop in a little from both ends. And I'll be doing more of this on the other side. Oop, let's tighten that down a little bit. It's one of the things I do like about this vise. So with a little bit of a crank, I get a full amount of friction all the way along this face. And uh, I can do a good bit, good bit of chopping in the vise itself. And I'm just going to chop in along this line. Kind of creating a stop cut here. And that way when I come back in this way, if the grain does run away, then it's going to run into that stop cut. This is actually kind of hard because I'm doing it backhanded right now. Hard. Our kids are broadcasting to us. <laughs> the fun of having tech savvy kids. Are are there any kids nowadays that aren't tech savvy? Let me get my elbow out of there. I should switch back to this one. Give you guys a little bit more of an overview. I'm a little scared what now. What I'm doing here. Yeah, where are they going? I don't know. I heard one of them say pizza, and it's all frozen, so then that oh. would mean touching the oven, so. Now, if Melody figured out how to use the oven safely, well, you know. How to use what? The oven safely, because I thought JJ said pizza. Oh. I think she made a store. That's what she's doing. Okay. Yeah, let me switch back and show you this. Two. Two? There we go. Huh. So now we have... This side all cut out. We're going to reverse it over and do this side. And it's pretty similar, except for there's a few deeper cuts in here that I want to show you something I do on that. So, let's clamp Which just this made thing. me think of the country song. Which one? The first cut is the deepest. 
Is that country? I think so. I think it's Leanne Womack. I don't know. Uh, I could be wrong. Pop this out because I made this long cut down here at an angle. So if I come in this way and just tap it. Hey, look at that. Our work's almost done. <laughs> it's amazing how fast things can do when you're decent with a saw to cut in. So I'm gonna make a couple stop cuts here. I'm gonna pry down a little ways, and then I'm gonna come back from this angle and pry in a little ways. Because if I go too deep from, e from any one side, then I'm gonna splinter out and cause problems. Because I don't want those cracks to run across into wood that I'm keeping. Hey, we're getting close here. Okay, Google, broadcast. Kids, I'm trying to record. Can you be quiet upstairs? Thank you. Just so you all know, when I'm trying to record, I'm usually not quite that nice. Yes, goodness. <laughs> that was a very... Unfortunately, because I was that nice, they're probably going to ignore me now. <laughs> so we've, we've cut in there. I could come in with my round spoke shave here and do some little detail work. Mm -hmm. And I love this spoke shave. I would love to see someone remake this one because I can actually switch out the mouth on this to be round or flat. Uh, just a really, really cool spoke shave. Um, or I could come in with a file and clean it out that way. And often when I get close to the line, the file is actually my tool of choice because I can get really close. Now we got Johnny nice Cash going because you're walking the like line. <laughs> I don't know. I'm full of the musical quotes tonight. And let's start by knocking off this end. Oops, I'm not in focus there, sorry. I am in focus. Now you can see I'm actually pounding towards myself. That's because of the camera view. Um, don't pound towards yourself. And I'll not lop off this corner. And sometimes people will have a problem with that last bit because the more you come around the corner, the more you're cutting across the grain. Well, then if you go in from the end, uh, from the side, you can actually clean out pretty quickly if you go across the piece as, a cro a cro uh, as opposed to <laughs> across the piece. <laughs> What's the word I'm looking for? I'm sure someone will remind me in a minute. Rather than going across the end grain, or, or yeah, it's easier to go across the board than across the end. <laughs> I'm not making much sense. <laughs> so once I get that, then I'm going to start wrapping this end. Flip it over, bevel down, gives you a little more control. And then I'm just going to run down that line. Just like that. And then I can come in with a spoke shave and clean up any of those marks left from that. Catch. Got this spot here. Oh, that's not quite heavy enough. Let me just tighten that up a little bit. Screw All right. Over. So with this, I can actually. We can clean that up. You mind talking to them, babe? <laughs> there we go. Nice and clean. I don't know if you guys listening could hear that. <laughs> Fun of having kids at home. So now we've done. Oh wow, we're doing good in time. I might actually move on to something else. So now we've cleaned up this side, this curve here, and we can do the same thing on this last curve. 
And with the same idea we just had, we have to cut in stop cuts from either end. So I'm going to start here. Just tap in a stop cut. Then come in from this end, do the same thing here. And then with each time, I'm going to go a little deeper until I get down to depth across there. And so if I do get anything that splits out and runs across, I'll hit that other stop cut rather than cutting into wood that I want to keep. The other thing I'm learning that the grain is running in a good direction here. So I can be a little more wild, take off a little bit more, a little faster than I normally would, because it is obeying me. Unlike my kids. <laughs> Why would their kids ever obey their father? Yeah. All right, so I had a question. Sure, what's that? All right, Tim Chi would ask, he missed it. Did you do a stop cut just before that end piece before chiseling toward it? Yes. Um, that stop cut was actually done earlier when I was doing the rough cut. I think you were talking about this little nub here. I did a, oops, this little nub here, I did a cut coming all the way down when the piece was rough down to depth there. So that then when I chopped in from this end, I could stop it. Um, I think that was the one you're talking about. But yes, I always try and do a stop cut so that things do not run away. So I'm coming with a spoke shave and clean this up. Get rid of all that roughness. Then use the curved one to get in a little tighter spots. Actually, I'm going to use the chisel a little more here. So I'm just going to go back and forth between chisel, spoke shave, file, to bring it in somewhat close to the line. I'm not worrying about it too much because we're going to be doing a lot of refining cuts later. Just trying to wrap things up a little bit. Uh, there's another tool you can use. Let me show you that. And this <laughs> spot here. Can I see that? Yes, we can. So I have a gouge here that allows me to then come in and go across the grain. You see that? There you go. And so I can work in, because on this side I want to have a really nice tight radius here, so I can come in about halfway across. The good sharp gouge. You can clean that out really quickly. And then I'll turn around and try and come at it from the other side. So why wouldn't you just take it out and flip it around? Um, I could, but that would probably mean refocusing the camera. But in real life. Yeah, I'd just fl flip it around. Because we don't all do well, I would during our woodwork. I would have, I, I would, no, I would actually be over here, like this. Uh, ah. No, so, the <laughs> there's, there's always the fun of thinking about, where is the camera on this one? And am I going to be in the way of the camera? Because everyone loves to see my elbow. Um, I have a lot of video footage of that. And then well, at least that's file. not blinding them. All right. Clean that uh -oh. up. <laughs> All right. Duck says, did James tell us the difference between a coping saw and a turning saw? Yes, I can. Uh, I think earlier when Duck put that question in, I thought it was going to be a dad joke, and I was waiting yes. for it. <laughs> this, oops, let me move back over here. This is a coping saw. Um, it, they're a fret saw and a coping saw are very, very similar. Usually a fret saw is a much, much smaller blade, um, more detailed, whereas a coping saw tends to be a little bit thicker blade, a little bit more rugged steel. Uh, whereas a turning saw is a bigger frame, usually at least 12 inches. Um, it is more of a bow saw that has a bigger blade on it. You think like a, a bandsaw blade goes on a turning saw, whereas um, a scroll saw blade goes on a fret saw. So that's kind of the, the power tool equivalent of a 
turning saw and a fret saw is a band saw and a scroll saw. Hope that makes sense. Good question, though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I think we have two pieces, and so you kind of get an idea about how these will. Make sure flip over to this one and show you this a little bit closer. How these will look and what I'm looking for in the shape here is that when these come together, you can see how the tops of these bend together and it just makes it a little bit more ornate to have these bend in as opposed to having them straight up and down. And so with that, and then I can put in some more carving in here, a little bit of our curly cue up here, um, a little bit of Celtic thing coming in. And I want to do a Celtic weave coming from the uh, the arm here into the Okay, I don't member. know that you're on the so right camera, careful. my dear. Am I on? Oh, I'm still on one. Sorry. I thought I flipped over again. And it helps if I look up at the dots. I've got some an LED display on the ceiling, it tells me, but I have to look at it. Yeah, here you can see how these bend in as opposed to being straight vertical. Um, so it just makes it a little bit more ornate. So the idea is then to do some carving, um, well, doing like a, a curly cue like you'd have on a uh, um, violin and then some Celtic weave coming on the, the arms and then across into the, 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 the beam and then possibly doing like a, a trinity in the middle of the beam. That's what I'm kind of thinking through. So um, this is what I have for tonight. Just kind of doing the rough end on this. Um, between now and the next time, I'm going to rough out the beam that comes between them because it's basically the exact same thing except for the beam is just a straight rod. I'm not going to do anything special on that. I'm going to follow the pattern uh, fairly closely. And then uh, next week, we're actually going to be working on making the tenon between the beam and the two arms so that we can actually make a turning saw. Once we have that tenon in there, then the next piece is putting in the hardware into these, putting a string between it and a tensioner on the string, and we have a functioning saw. So hopefully in two more lessons, we'll actually have a working saw. It just will be a really ugly working saw. Um, so that is what I have. Is there any questions for tonight? Yeah, so going back cool. up, Jonathan Boatman asked, or said, I've heard Paul Sellers talk about going with the grain. Whoa, you got really close. And yes. all, but he says that you can feel the, feel the direction better than seeing. Watching you chisel made me think about that, and could you elaborate? Yeah. Um, there... When, when you're working with hand tools, you get all five senses that get going. Um, I mean, you even have some taste in there. I mean, there, there's the dust in the air and things like that. Just they, they get exciting at some points. Um, but particularly, your hearing and your feel are some of your most important feedback sensors. Uh, like when you're using a plane, um, there's a certain sound and a pitch that it makes that feels really good. And then as the pitch gets lower, or you start to hear a slight bit of vibration, you know that the plane is getting dull. And you can do that all by your, your, your sense of, of hearing. Um, the grain is often a fairly similar thing because um, if you imagine the, the fibers of the wood, you know, like this, if you're cutting across the grain, you'd be you know, cutting that way. If you're cutting with the grain, then you're cutting this way. Um, and when you're cutting with the grain, um, and if you're going like a low angle plane or something of that nature, uh, well, let me, let me switch that around and just make it a little more simple. Um, going against the grain is when the grain is kind of turned up like this and your plane blade comes in this way. And what happens is it actually ends up splitting the fibers and pushing them away. And so you get this crack that then runs down the grain. When you're going with the grain, the fibers are actually down like this and you end up shearing them all off. They, the grain won't split away. And so you, you can hear a slight difference between those two because when you're shearing it, you get this high pitched, um, almost like a, like a, screeching sound as it goes through it's a sound I mean that's actually the sound of the blade slicing each individual fiber and when you're going against the grain you actually get a little bit more of a cracking sound and what sometimes will happen is the blade will go a little ways you know catch on a fiber and then it'll snap it and then it'll go and catch on a fiber and snap it and that gives you a little bit lower pitch sound um, and it also you get this like uh, almost a crackling sound to it as the fibers are actually ripping um, and so those are they're, they're tiny, tiny little differences that you pick up over time, and you'll, you'll feel it in your hand if you're going against the grain. It almost it feels like it's catching or a little bit of vibration in there. Um, and there's a lot of other things that come out of it, but those are some of the things that you'll, you'll notice over time <laughs> as, as you play with it. But if you ever want to actually play with it, 
go out to the wood and, and find a board where the grain is very obviously running across. Here, let me show you what I'm talking about. There we go. So find a board in your stash where the grain is naturally running at an angle across the board this way. And if you plane it that way, when I mean, all the grain is running this way, you run the plane this way, you'll hear that higher pitch, really nice clean sound. And then when you turn the plane around and come this way, you'll, you'll feel that catching, you'll feel that more of a, of a crackling sound to it. Um, and experience that and, and actually catch on to what that is and it'll make you a much better woodworker. So, chattering on long enough. What's next? All right. Sorry. Um, Kim Allen asks, do all coping saws have pins and front saws no pins? Um, there is, um, co commonly, yes, definitively, no, um, because there's other types of saws that come in there, and, and I, I, most readily I'm thinking of a jeweler's saw. Um, I think what, let me show you in this one and this one. Oof, that blade is bad. Let me show you what I'm talking about, though. <laughs> uh, two. So... Here is a fret saw and a coping saw. Um, this one with the long neck, is a, long neck is a coping saw. And it actually has um, two screws here that tighten down onto it. And they're basically two plates that come together and pinch the blade to hold it in place. So theoretically, the blade can move in and out. It's just two blades that are, that are holding it together. Whereas commonly with a coping saw, um, the blade actually has these little pins that hold into place. Let me loosen this up and show you what I'm talking about. Um, and it, th yeah, that is a, a, a common difference, but it's not common enough that I would say it's definitive because I have seen good coping saws with pins and some without. Um, it has more to do with the size of the blade, but here, let me zoom in and see. Oop, there, there. My finger, I don't know if you can actually see it then is there are these pins on the end of this blade here. And those pins then clamp into, um, into the end of the, the saw frame. And that holds it in place so that this can't fall, pull out of the saw frame because it has those pins on the end. I don't know if you can see that or not, but I hope you can. Um, so yeah, that is a common difference, but I don't know if I would call it definitive. The, the biggest difference is that a coping saw tends to have a bigger blade, usually an eighth inch to a quarter inch, uh, whereas a fret saw tends to have an eighth inch or smaller um, blade. So, yeah. What's next? What? When did he start? I'm trying to figure out what Connor Vlog is saying. When did he start She Would Work? I'm wondering if he's asking when did you start your woodwork? When did I start to woodwork? Um, the first thing I ever did in the shop, I was five years old. Um, I have been in the shop ever since, and I've almost always had some shop. Um, but hand tools are a newer development. I've only picked that up in the last three years or so. Um, as I actually not as, honestly never held a plane until about three years ago. Uh, well, at least uh, I, I never actually worked. I think I've held a couple block planes before that. But to me, they were always like these antique things you'd never use uh, until uh, I, I well, moved to this house. Uh, but if you actually want to go back and watch my oldest videos on this channel, this channel is a documentation of everything from me literally picking up my first hand plane and going through restoring it and woodworking from then on. Uh, so if you want to follow... You know, how did I get into hand tools? That's what this channel is all here for. So you can actually go back and look at my first video is I brought home a plane and I took it apart and said, here's my first hand plane. We're going to restore it. This is going to be kind of fun. Um, and it was more or less a documentation for my own sake um, until the channel started taking off. And then that's where I actually turned it into wood by right. Um, so, yeah, go have fun looking at those. I'm, I'm sorry for the quality of those videos, though. <laughs> They're bad. Gotta start somewhere. All right, Wayne Dixon asks, do you use the bow saw on the push stroke or pull stroke, or does it depend? You can use it whatever way you want. And I find myself um, doing it different ways at different times. Um, if I'm working on a uh, bird's mouth, which is um, this contraption that I will put into the vise, so I can put my work on here and I can pull down. I'm often using it with 
uh, with a fret saw or a coping saw, I'll be coming in here. I, I want to use it on the push uh, on the pull stroke, so I'm actually pulling the wood down into the surface. Um, but that being said, I um, I do occasionally use it on the push stroke. Um, um, yeah, excuse me. On, yes, on the, yes, on the push stroke. Um, if I'm using it in the vise, I'm usually going to be um, pushing across the board because it is far more natural feeling for me using Western saws to push the saw through. Um, but in the bird's mouth, I'm going to be pulling the saw. Um, and there are a few variants of that. That's the nice thing about the saw, though, is um, if you want to use it on the push or pull stroke, you just turn the saw around, and it works very well. Um, if you watch some of my earlier videos with the big Rubo style frame saw, uh, I was experimenting with which way do I like it, do I want to push it or do I want to pull it? And so I'm actually turning the saw around sometimes and people have asked me, why aren't you holding the handles? It's because I'm playing with do I like to push it or pull it? And the answer to that is it depends. <laughs> All right, Joe R asks, <clears throat> do you ever miss using power tools? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if it wasn't for Wood by Wright, I, I, would, I would definitely have power tools in the shop. They have a, a great use for it. Um, I, I'm not a traditionalist or an elitist. Um, I, I have, I mean, if you go in my garage, I have a, um, a table saw and a planer. I, I have a, a good collection of power tools. Um, I just don't use them on projects for videos. Um, if they're projects around the house, oh yeah, I use pull-out power tools. Uh, because they're, they're faster, they're more efficient. Um, if, if I'm building a project to get it done, power tool is the way to go. If I'm building a project to have fun, experience it, and I don't care if I get it done, I don't care if I mess up, um, then I'm using hand tools uh, because it's it's far more enjoyable uh, for me the the experience and time with hand tools. Okay, so. the real reason you got in hand tools is because your shop shares with my laundry room. Yes. And wood curls yeah. are much cleaner than sawdust. Yeah, if sawdust. you look at my the early that videos, is the real reason he got my, into hand tools. Let's my my be wife's um, wedding dress actually was in the wood shop for the first what year or Until so. We bought the, shop. the house, yeah. Um, so yeah, she had no problem with her wedding dress being in my wood shop. Um, but yeah, that is really the, the, the big reason why I got into hand tools. It's, I, I, I don't think I ever would, except we moved into this house and it had a shop space, um, 10 foot by 8 foot. I don't know, 10 foot by 11 foot. And um, then I, be, I was a stay-at-home dad, and so I was looking for something that I could do with the kids. Uh, it, it's safer, there's less dust, I can do it in a small space. It just all these things came together and it was exactly what I needed. And uh, interesting things happened at the right time and then I became a hand tool woodworker. <laughs> Ta-da! And here we are today. And then we bought the house and we could modify things. So. Yeah, yeah. All right, Tim Chiwood asks, how thin is too thin for the stock of this saw? Um, it depends on the wood you're making out of. You're going to make it out of something like maple or beech. Um, the, the plans call for... What did they have? It was something ridiculously thin. Um, I mean, not like ridiculously thin as in bad thin. It was uh, 23 30 seconds is what they listed. 30 um, seconds? Yes, 23 30 seconds. So it ends up being just shy of um, three quarters of an inch. Um, here, where's the actual dimension here? Is 0.63 inches. That's. Measurement that is definitely an American thing because it's not metric and it doesn't <laughs> even have. No, what, I, what I'm guessing is that he made the saw and then took exact measurements of everything. Uh -huh. um, and so he probably started with three quarter inch stock and then trimmed it down to 0.63 inches. Um, if you were doing it out of, out of maple, you could probably get it even thinner than that, uh, maple or, or beech. Um, but you probably don't want to get it too much thinner than that. Um, the the top of the the top of the artistic frame you can make this much thinner, but where your hand it will hold the frame, you don't want it too thin because then it feels really weird. Um, now you, and one of the nice things about a turning saw is that normally you can hold the handle just like you would with a fret saw or coping saw, or you can hold the beam and use it like a you know a Western push saw as you're actually in line with your with your arm um, so you get that that flexibility between the two what else we got? all right greg dent says heaven forbid but if you ever had to put a value on all your hand tools for insurance purposes what do you think the tools tools would be worth to purchase in the condition they are now um 
on in my hand tools in other words the tools on the wall here the tools that i use in the shop i have probably about thirty-five hundred dollars that i've spent on them um because I'm, I'm pretty picky and I tend to buy the really rusty things. Um, and that's probably right, right. Uh, cause I, I've been collecting tools for almost, almost two years, uh, before I crossed the thousand dollar mark on all the tools I've spent in my shop. Um, which in a wood shop, that's incredibly cheap. <laughs> um, if I were to put a price tag on everything I have in the shop and what it's actually worth, in other words, what I would sell it right now, I would probably end up putting it somewhere around $10,000 would be my top of the head guess. Something like that. Hope that answers your question. So Tim says if your tools come up missing, Greg is suspect number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then another Greg, Greg Cheng, Set asks any books that focus on woodworking skill and projects you would recommend. Um, I honestly have to confess, I'm I, I do not, I, I have read a whole lot of, was of woodworking answer. books, but I, I don't. Um, reading for me is a really crummy way of gaining information. Um, Ooh. yes, there's a ton of great information to be gleaned that way, um, but it can also be gleaned a lot of other ways, and so I find that to be a very inefficient way of reading. Uh, getting information because of my reading speed is so atrociously slow that it is um, it's, it's a bad way for me to get information um, so I'm not the best person to answer that question because I, I look at books as a really horrible thing but you would recommend lots of YouTube videos and channels yeah 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 I would. Um, <laughs> That's not to say that books are bad. Don't 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 get me wrong. Uh, they they are a fantastic source of great information. Especially a lot of the older books have some information that you just can't find other places. Um, and in that case, then yes, it's it's worth going back and, and digging through them. Um, but now a lot of that information can be found online and in other formats, and so that's usually where I try and get it. If I can't find it online, I know people who've read the books, and I'll call them up and say, hey, can you give me information about this? And they'll be like, yeah, here's the basic information you need. I'm like, yes, thank you. And that's how I get through things. <laughs> or his wife reads it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I think we got through all the questions. Cool. I think that's about, uh, about time. So, um, yes, next week we'll be working on the beam between the two and actually getting that up and going. And hopefully the week after that we'll have a functioning saw. So this will be kind of fun. And I'm interested to see how much detail I actually put in this because I really want to do a kind of a bang up job on this and, and doing a lot of scroll work and other detail. Um, so I'll probably be doing each. Like, the, the nice things about this is there'll be, there'll be four Celtic patterns on this. And it'll be the exact same Celtic pattern in four different places. So I'll probably do one of them live and then do the others on my own time. Um, that way you can see it, but not have to bore you for five hours of it. Um, my estimation is that this whole project with the amount of carving and detail I'm going to be putting into it is somewhere around uh, 14 to 20 hours worth of work. Um, but it may end up being more than that. We'll find out. So um, that's about it for this week. I think this has been kind of fun. Uh, let me know your thoughts, ideas, comments. Um, if there's something you'd like to see done in the future, I would love to hear that. So I think that's about it for today. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. <laughs> Click. I'm trying to get my mouse. It's over here on my screen. I know. It's stuck. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs>